Truck World TV, sponsored by Auto Trader Trucks. Welcome to another episode of Truck World TV here from our home from home of Junction 38 services on the M6. Now this is actually our last show of the current series but don't forget you can check out all of the previous episodes on our website which is truckworldtv.co.uk and now we are actually planning series three so if you've got any thoughts, ideas, suggestions for features or maybe fashion tips for Tim and I uh, please let us know on the email or of course Twitter which is truckworld underscore TV. But of course on with tonight's episode and this is what's coming up. Tim tests his sea legs with a trip from Belfast to Liverpool on board a Stena Line freight crossing. We talk driver recruitment at one of the country's fastest growing haulage companies. Our driver chats this week here at Junction 38 are what drivers love about the industry and as a special treat we show you some of the outtakes from the filming of this current series. Now throughout this series we always like to highlight the incredible work that the haulage and logistics industries do in keeping the UK, Europe, the world moving with the supply of goods and services and without those industries everything would grind to a halt. Yeah but of course it's not just 9 to 5, it's 24 hours, 7 days a week and the trucks are travelling the length and breadth of the UK and one important part of that is the cross water links that we have. So myself and the crew decided to go across to Belfast to see what's involved in taking hundreds of tracks and trailers across the Irish Sea. We start a journey at the Belfast Ferry Terminal in Northern Ireland, which every day sees thousands of foot passengers, cars and of course heavy trucks and trailers arrive to make the crossing to Scotland and Liverpool. Now and as you can see the work has started, what you will notice is that it's actually mainly trailers, not trucks and trailers but trailers with the shunters and what will happen is the trailers come along and then they're dropped off here and then the shunters will take them off when we get to Liverpool. The capacity of this boat is around about the 130 mark. We've got about 90 on with us at the moment in terms of trailers, but there also are a contingent of tractors and trailers. There's about another 10 or 15 trucks like that as well. So there's a little bit of a mixture, but the vast majority will be trailers only. To the uninitiated, this process might look straightforward, but with each vehicle potentially weighing 44 tonnes and with a wide variety of cargoes, the loading teams have to make sure that everything is evenly distributed on the ferry and also that the trailers and the trucks are fully secured so that whatever the Irish Sea throws at it, the vehicles stay put. Above the cargo deck, however, it's a much more relaxed atmosphere and more like a floating hotel with drivers able to recharge their own batteries and, if required, catch up on their sleep during the eight hour crossing to Liverpool. We caught up with some of them in the driver's lounge. Uh, males, sourced males, princes from our customers all over the country. We pick it up, bring it back to our place, sort it into destination, loads of vehicles, and away you go to uh, all the Royal Mail centres all over the country. Ah, uh, well, mixture. So if we're trying concentrating low loaders, carrying crushers and screeners, and then machinery cars back into Ireland again, but if we do a bit of fridge work and curtain tailor work as well, and that side of the things will be quiet. You know, so we do a European work there as well. I've driven Scania's most of my life, most of my driving career, um, from uh, 113s to 143s, 144s, 164s. Well, the night ferry, you get on, I mean, last night I got on about 9 o'clock, came in here, had my dinner, had a cup of tea, watched, had a read. Come quarter past 10, you, it's bedtime, so uh, get to bed about half 10, slept well. Next thing it's Half five this morning and they're waking you up, so uh, that's good, that's good. The funny thing is, sometimes if you miss this boat, you can get the Scotland boat, which is only two and a half hours crossing, but then you've got a five hour drive back to Warrington, so you'd rather get on this one, you know. Oh, the phrase is 100%, you couldn't complain, like, you know, just after a steak and chips, you're just 100%. <laughs> With all the cargo safely loaded, it's time for the ferry to depart for Liverpool and a journey that occurs twice a day, every day. We caught up with senior captain Neil Whitaker 
to find out what it's like to be in charge of such a huge freight ship. Big difference is, uh, between a passenger ship and a freight ship, not least the rules and regulations we have to comply with. You know, on a passenger ship, completely different to a freight ship, you know, very stringent. Obviously, you're carrying lots of passengers. Like this ship, we can carry 700 passengers. You know, yeah. on a freight ship, you might just have 30 crew. So the rules and regulations are a lot different. And, you know, to conform with that can be quite difficult, quite challenging at times, and quite expensive, to be honest. It's quite difficult to manoeuvre a light ship. You know, it's very skittish, they call skittish. Like, it's like being on an ice rink. You know, everything you do slides that way or slides this way. With a fully loaded ship down in the water, you know, it's a lot easier. She's more predictable, you know. You kind of know what she'll do. You know, but when she's light ship and kind of wind blowing, it's like an empty biscuit tin. Really difficult to control. Turnarounds are a major focus for us. Really are, you know. Uh, our target is four hours. And uh, because, you know, we have to... One of the most important things we do is keep the ships on schedule. Because our, our freight customers expect us to arrive when we tell them they're going to arrive. Because all, all their markets are dependent on the ship arriving on time. So turnaround times are really important. And we spend a lot of time and energy making sure we hit them targets. You know, and, and, and the trade-off there, if we can get away early sometimes, it's a four-hour target we, we try and hit in Belfast and Birkenhead. But if we can do it in under four hours, like three and a half hours, it means we spend more time at sea. If we spend more time at sea, we can pull the power back and not go as, you know, not as fast, if you like, which means we save more fuel. So it's like a win-win situation, but it can be difficult sometimes. You get a full ship, lots of these drop trailers coming on, you know, they take a long time to load. We're loading like 140, 150 trailers on the turnaround. That's loading. We're also discharging the same. So you've got about 300 moves, 300 moves on a turnaround. So it, it can be hard the four hours and it, we, we do make it. We do make it, but it, it's tough. It really is tough, yeah. So as you can tell, we're coming into port. Uh, over there on the left-hand side, we've got Liverpool. On the right-hand side, we've got Birkenhead. We're actually going to be berthing at Birkenhead. So this is, we're about half an hour out now, and the work really does start now for the guys and girls downstairs. They're starting to unshackle the trailers. Don't forget, they've got nearly 100 trailers to do that. So we're going to go downstairs and see where all the action is. As soon as the ship has docked, it's all systems go once again as each vehicle is carefully offloaded and it's amazing to think that this process is happening at ports all over the world all of the time. Here is Stan Alliance Head of Freight UK, Richard Horswell. Well across uh, 23 routes in Stan Alliance, we, we move about 2 million freight pieces a year. Um, just to put that in context, that's a queue of traffic that would stretch right around the world, at least once right, right around the world, yeah. I think as, as uh, the economy's been recovering from the recession, we've seen more and more freight and really, the amount of freight we carry is a barometer of how the economy is performing in a way. I would say uh, there's been a gradual shift to unaccompanied freight. So you see ports like Birkenhead here, where we have a lot of star standage space for trailers. Uh, and there's a gradual movement from what we call accompanied freight to unaccompanied. The unaccompanied is where we use our own uh, tugmasters and stevedores to actually load the freight on and off the ships. Um, this has come about really as a, as a result of stricter rules for, for drivers, efficiency and also to a certain extent environmental legislation. It's nearly 7 o'clock now and they've got to get to around about 90 to 100 trailers off here, accompanied or unaccompanied. Uh, depending on what's happening with it. And don't forget, this ferry's got to get the turnaround around about three and a half to four hours, and it's going to make its way for at half past ten back to Belfast. That looked uh, like, like fun. How was your stomach? On the it wasn't too bad, actually. Thank God it was like a mill pond, so I was a bit worried because my dad's bad as well, and I'm not a great sailor, I must admit. But at eight hours, I mean, how does that work from the tachograph when you can do it if you go further up north or across I know, the Scotland a couple of hours? It's a bit of a shock at first because I thought to myself, why the hell would they go eight hour, on eight hours sailing when you can do it in two and a half with the, the Belfast Larn or Larn Stranra, it used to be, I don't know what it's called now. Uh, but yeah, what, what the big thing for them is the fact that they can have, the drivers can have the rest or eight hours rest so that they, when they land in Liverpool, they can actually then start immediately to work. But also the fact that if you go across the, the Scottish route, by the time you come down, you use your hours up anyway, so you have to have a rest anyway around the Preston area. So it means the fact that it's probably more efficient and fits in with a lot of customers' operation to go on that route yeah. rather than across the top way. 
Now, speaking of efficiency and supreme systems, it's a little bit like this show, isn't it, really? Because oh, <laughs> we're, we're kind of known as one take wonders, aren't we? Nothing yeah. ever goes wrong, does no, it? Correct, exactly. That's it. I don't, you know, we just don't need to record. It could be live, this, and no problem. It could be, it could be live. You heard it here. Well, because this is the last episode in the series, we thought we'd give you... We've, we've had to really struggle to dig out oh, yeah. some of the bits where perhaps making the show didn't go as smoothly as we'd like. Possibly, yeah. Now, when it comes to MAN, as far as whistle bells concerned, you can't get any more whistlier or bellier than this vehicle here. <laughs> this is, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. And here on the Aveco stand is the UK reveal of the something or other concept vehicle. The interdrive. You don't have to do anything else at all. Uh, you might go over the odd speed bump, as I just have, and a little bit faster than maybe I should have done. <laughs> but that shows you have to concentrate on your driving. The instrument panel itself is a nice instrument panel. It's very analog based. Actually, I've now realised there's no good speed to these speed bumps. <laughs> They're vicious speed bumps. I've got down to six miles an hour and I've still got the great suspension. I mean, it does really test this uh, air suspension on the back of this uh, FE. Here from our home from home at Junction 38 services on the M6. Yeah, as ever, it's been a very. <clears throat> One now. Oh, we're not counting that. A dual passenger seat is standard, and the thing I do like about it is. is how easy this vehicle just flicks around like that. It is easy if you get it right here. That's the important bit. I've learned that lesson, as I do with life. And there's some really clever ideas. Things like the completely clear, see through front corner pillars. That's right. And joining me now is. <laughs> <laughs> Bang on cue, Peter. Bang on cue. It's all right. I'd have fluffed it up anyway, so. Appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you again. Yeah, that's it, and it's great to look down on you as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry, yeah. 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 Grown a bit too. <laughs> <laughs> right, cheated it ever so slightly. Yeah, okay, that's it. Oh, if, I, if I came down to my real high, that'd be it. Well, yeah, and whistles and bells, you can't get a vehicle better than this. Nothing more. Oh, no. Okay. For someone who loves the big, huge trucks like the, the daft that we had in that first episode, you seem to have a real fondness for that little truck. <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, it's an MAN, not a daft, I hope. So, as you can see, maybe things don't run as smoothly as possible. Uh, and also, I'm sure there's a lot more clippings of Rob. A couple, uh, a couple. Yeah, exactly, that's it. They're on the floor at the moment. But anyway, that's it for part one, and we'll see you after the break. Truck World TV, sponsored by Auto Trader Trucks.